all new, Mel B knows who's got talent. He is mine. I'm like laughing so much, my jaw is aching. Now feast your eyes on America's Got Talent, Steve Harvey style. Wowza. Yeah, you got abs. I'll do that. My stomach will be on the floor. <laughs> then Steve's biggest loser battle is back. Pardon me, <laughs> did you just drop it? Yeah. <laughs> Steve Harvey, today at 2 on NBC for New York. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliate stations coast to coast present Baseball, Beer, and Barbecue. No hitter for Arietta. Discussing baseball, good drinks, and food. So, um, the... We're clear for a minute so I can write down the damn time. It just got weird. With Ted Hicks. Everybody wants to be Bartolo. Todd Vandenberg. The handsomest man on the entire goddamn tour. And Lee Vowell. Folks, look around. Anyone who's not singing in the choruses is a racist. Every Saturday morning at 10 a.m. on the Happy Hour Network. Welcome to the NFL Preview Special Edition of Baseball, Beer, and Barbecue with Ted. Ted, how are you? No, oh, we can't hear you, Ted. I, Ted, I'm going to mute you for the rest of the show. Todd and Lee. So like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Baseball, Beer, Barbecue. I shouldn't say barbecue, I guess, should I? BBQ? Baseball, Beer, BBQ? I guess that's what I should say. Yeah, you should say that. Yeah. At Baseball, Beer, BBQ. What do you think, Ted? Oh, I forgot. I'm muted. So we will talk at the bottom of the hour with Russell Baxter, the great Russell Baxter of ProFootballGuru.com and other sites. And later with Sharona of Backtalk with Sharona, which is a great name for a southern lady to have, right? Backtalk with Sharona. <laughs> it is. It is indeed. And I, the outline says I am in red, which I'm never in red. I'm always in blue, so it threw me off. So I, was, I I'll almost say this. didn't say anything. I'll say this. I was way too lazy. Wait, after I made the outline, we still had Ted, who's muted currently, and I thought, eh, why not mute the guy, you know? So uh, I, I was way too lazy to change all the colors, so I was like, Todd is now red. Because I made everything red. So. At least you changed it to Todd is red. That, that was helpful. Uh, there are other places you can hear us other than in your ears. You can hear us at I-95 Sports Network, RF Sports, XRP Radio, iHeart Radio, iTunes, Arena Sports Network. And a special shout out to a couple individual enterprises. Computer Repair NC. At CJ computers nc 919-653-8496 they will fix everything in the world for you except your hot sauce needs and for those you need cappy's original wicked hot sauce find it on ebay it will be the best 80 dollars you ever spend in your life that would get you 20 bottles but that would do you for the rest of your life so there you go cappy's original wicked hot sauce feel the burn (laughs) <laughs> and it's good. It's good stuff, oh, right? It's, yeah, seriously. I really, really like that stuff. And a little goes a long way, like four drops, and, and you're good for your meal. I mean, it's it's hot, but it does have has a good flavor. Some hot sauces, you know, they just go for, let's destroy your, you know, mucus linings mm-hmm. in your entire body, and you can't taste anything. It has a great flavor, and it is, it is wicked hot, but it, it, it tastes really good. Good stuff. Cappy's original wicked hot sauce found on eBay. And... If you're listening to the show on Saturday or whenever you're listening to it, we're actually recording this on Thursday. So we don't have the ability to tell the future of what's going to happen in the next two days. If something horrible has happened in the next two days, we apologize. We don't mean it to happen. Um, But hopefully if you need a a respite from that, you can actually listen to the show. So thanks for listening. There you go. And yeah, exactly. So and if we talk, we're going to talk standings. We're going to talk some U.S. Open stuff as well. And, of course, mostly NFL, but, you know, we, we aren't going to be able to talk the, the semifinals of the ladies or men at the U.S. Open, but, you know, that, we'll still talk a little bit. kind of. So before we get into all that, let's talk presidential polls, because CNN had a poll that said Trump had a lead, a huge lead in independent voters, which was very concerning. So it looks like in every other poll – Except for the CNN poll that I'm looking at, and this is based on real, realclearpolitics.com, uh, Clinton has a, a small lead, um, but a lead, and Trump, that's the only one he leads in. So 
you know, before there was a little bit of a difference for Clinton, pro Clinton. Is this just how politics works? Or are you concerned about these these numbers kind of falling back a little bit? Yeah, I'm concerned. Um, a little bit. Yeah, that's how politics work. But yeah, it's it's concerning. It's concerning that. I don't know if you got a chance to catch the Commander in Chief forum last night, which was terribly formatted, and um, Flower did the one with one with Gina Davis. Yes, the one with Gina Davis. Uh, Gina Davis did a terrible job in her Matt Lauer impersonation. It was uh, he he just uh, it was not well well done. Let's put it that <laughs> way. The the concept of let's talk about an, an extremely important role that the next president will have, and we're going to give him slightly less than 30 minutes really to field all these questions and there's really not much time for follow up and it's like okay we got to hurry we got to hurry he's like that's just that's silly um but but again Trump gave some interesting I'm sorry Mr. Trump I want to be respectful he gave some interesting answers again saying that well he's got a plan but he's not going to reveal it and then he'll talk to the generals and he'll give them 30 days to give him a plan and if he likes it he'll go with that and and he's already said what his plan is. I mean, he's going to bomb the crap out of him or other terms and bomb until there's nothing left. And then he's going to rebuild it. And then we'll take the oil, which, of course, is a war crime under international law. And you can't do that. And Yeah, he really doesn't have much concept of how things well, actually he'll, he'll work. Well, he'll change the laws. Yeah, he'll change the laws. He'll fire the generals, which he can't do. I mean, there's a lot of things he thinks he's going to do that he can't do, which is – you know, it's concern again. It concerns me that a lot of people, that so many people support him because they don't realize he can't do a lot of the things he says well, he's going to do. We're a stupid country, right? I mean, let's be honest. We're pretty dumb. We're a dumb populace. The general populace is pretty dumb. I mean, we don't know. You know, most of the people don't know he can't do that stuff. So it's just whatever he's saying, and he's good at whatever he's saying. I mean. To the people who want to vote for him, right. he's good at what, at what he's saying. So if you just keep saying it over and over, right. Goebbels, uh, you know it becomes. <laughs> yeah, and, and, exactly. and I, I joke, but that's basically no. It's not just Donald Trump, but that's what politics has come to. If you say it enough, yeah. if you say a lie enough, it becomes a truth. Sure, absolutely. And and it's not just know, Trump. You're absolutely right. It's not just Trump. I mean, I've got my my. Hesitations with Hillary. I mean, I don't see that there's any choice between Hillary and Hillary and Trump. But again, I was supporting Sanders, you know, and we all, all three of us. Ted's on mute; he can't verify that, but he was supporting Mr. Sanders as well, Senator Sanders. But she came off, and I thought much better last night than Mr. Trump did, just because, like she started out saying, you've got to have a reason to judgment, and you just can't fly off the handle. And you know, you got a guy who's bragging about how. Putin is a great leader because he's got an 82% approval rate. And it's like, that's kind of a different uh, system over there, in case you're unaware of that, sir. Um, you know, it's, yeah, let's invade the Crimea and, and let's, let's annex Crimea and let's invade Ukraine and, you know, all those, little, all those little fun tricks he used to play when he was a KGB intelligence officer. And it's like, good guy, that Putin. So, yeah, by all means, make sure you stand in his corner. And well, not and, NATO's. It's like, what? How is this guy? <laughs> I have a really hard time understanding how the Republican Party, in the majority, of, supports a candidate who disavows NATO and has said more than once that we should consider pulling out of NATO and backs Russia. It's like, what bizarro fucking world are we in? That's that's insane to me. Makes no sense well, whatsoever. He's the Republican Party candidate, so that's who they have to vote for. Yeah, yeah, I'm, right. I'm, I'm real. But getting back to the polls just a bit, yeah. I guess the one thing that uh, – well, if, if you're pro-Hillary, I guess thing, the one good thing about the CNN poll is they had Trump at 45 percent of the electorate, and he's that's much higher than any other poll. Forty percent is the next highest, and that's uh, George Washington University. And then that's the only other thing that's and that's 40, and anything else below that is in the 30s. So mm. it's 45, 40, and then all the 30s. Clinton's numbers are all fairly consistent, anywhere from 39 to 43, several 42s, several 41s. So, you know, it, and again, this is all going to change. Of course, now they're going to have – it'll be interesting because I think this year, every year matters or every election year matters, but as far as the – the debates. It'll be interesting to see what that take has on the 
on the bearing of who gets elected to be the president of the United States, right? Because oh, yeah. we, we've definitely come to the point now where we're a knee-jerk reaction country to whatever Trump, – oh, Trump said this or Hillary said this. Yeah. And now it's going to be the debate. and Oh, last night they said this and mm-hmm. this and this. So. I, one of the comments Trump made, which is, you know, again, he does a lot of this. Well, I don't know, but I've heard people say this, and then this one he actually just said. I don't know about Hillary. She doesn't look presidential. Uh, what does a president look like? Uh, I mean, to me, that's code for she's not a man. How does she not look presidential? Interesting. Yeah. You know, and, and he an repeated that. Take. He repeated that more than once the other day, and it's like, what? I, you know, I don't understand what that's supposed to mean, other than. You know, code is like, oh my gosh, you know, she belongs in the kitchen. I, I <laughs> don't get it. I mean, yeah. who, who looks presidential? You know, what what does a president look like? I, I don't understand how he looks any more pres- seriously how he looks any more presidential than she does, or Gary Johnson, or Jill Stein, or Senator Sanders when he was in, or Senator Cruz, any of them. I mean, a president looks like the person who has the job. I mean, that's it. Very. Uh, Anyway, enough of him. Enough of him. What's in the word? Hi. I'm getting a very interesting message. Yes. That I'm getting a critical alert in my headphones from Microsoft. I'm not even sure what that means. Anyway, let's let's continue. I I will say the Fox poll even has Clinton up two points. And uh you know, I guess my my presidential person who how they would look, Jack Black. That that'd be cool. Jack Black would Jack be Black. sweet. He's, it looks very presidential to me. So, yes. moving on to baseball, before we start talking all the way into football, the standings currently, and this is again on Thursday, uh, based on Wednesday night's game, so we have two games to go, but the Red Sox lead the Blue Jays by a game, the Orioles by two. All three of those teams are wild card contenders at this point. The Yankees hanging in there at four and a half, amazingly eight games over 500, which goes, I think goes to show you what a great manager Joe Girardi is, honestly, because yeah. they could have fallen on their face. They should have fallen on their face, but, you know, he keeps them in the where they are. The Indians are five and a half up over the Tigers. The Tigers have fallen back a little bit over the last couple of days. Then the Royals are eight and a half back. The Rangers lead the Astros by eight and a half. The Nationals lead the Mets by eight and a half. And the Marlins have, unfortunately, two and eight in their last ten through Wednesday night's games or 13 and a half. The Cardinals catching up. They're only 15 and a half back of the Cubs uh, currently. <laughs> Cubs have lost two straight games, so it's anybody's ball game in the NL Central. And then the Dodgers, I don't even want to say what their lead is because it's, it's kind of weird. They've won five straight games. I'll say this about the Dodgers. They, for the second week in a row, and Todd, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, for the second week in a row, they have actually started four games in a row. They've started rookies, rookie pitchers for the second week in a row. That's how depleted their starting staff has right. been. And those rookie pitchers have done pretty well. I mean, they haven't done, like, they're not. Uh, well, Jose uh, De Leon's, uh, his first start in the major leagues, he gave up four runs and in six innings. He did strike out nine and didn't walk anybody, and he got the win. Was it a perfect game? No, of course not. But he pitched well enough to win, and if he can do that again and figure out, you know, nine strikeouts, no walk. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, exactly. He has an idea about what he's doing, and um, – you know, Urias is, is starting to kind of find his groove a little bit. Those other two guys that they have pitching stripling, it's, they're just fill-ins. But hopefully, you know, Clayton Kershaw is back on Friday. Of course, now that you're listening to this, possibly on Saturday, who knows what Clayton Kershaw did on Friday. Right. He either gave up 18 runs or he pitched a no-hitter. <laughs> and we're not talking about it, so I apologize. But, you know, it's a, a, lot of stuff, a lot of stuff happening. So in the wild card standings currently – the Blue Jays are up by a game. The Orioles would be the second team. The Tigers are game back. Um, of course, AL East is so bunched up. Yeah. It makes Tigers, it makes it harder for them because they have to climb really over two teams, even though there's only two teams above them in the wild card standing. Does that make sense? That's, mm-hmm. Yeah. That's kind of strange. The Astros, two games back. The Yankees are two and a half. Uh, at this point, if you're four games back, you still have a chance, but you're having to climb over so many teams. And then in the National League, the Giants are a half game up over the Mets and the Cardinals. So the Mets, even though everybody's down on the Mets, they've won five straight games, eight and two in their last ten games. Their pitching staff is – it's funny because the pitching staff everybody was talking about, this is the reason, same thing with the Nationals last year. This is the reason the Mets are going to get back to the World Series. 
they've kind of broken down a lot, and yet still the Mets eight games over five hundred, won five straight, eight and two in their last ten through Wednesday. Of course, they've lost their last two games going into Saturday by like twenty five to one run scores. I'm sure, but you know they're they're currently right now neck and neck with the Cardinals. So it's interesting. What happens if the Giants make the wild card and then we have two teams? Do we have a a game playoff into the one game, wild card in, play into the one game playoff? Huh? Is that how it would work? I don't know. That would be fun. That would be interesting. So your take on the standings? I I I am happy that the Tigers, my Tigers because I own them, that they're just a half game, not a half that they're a game out as of Thursday. Um, sure would help if they had won more than one game against the Indians, uh, but you know, the Indians are good. Uh, yeah, the I mean, Indians it's, are very not, good. But it's not like you're losing to the Twins. Yeah, but you shouldn't go one and eleven against anybody. So you know, <laughs> unless you're playing the Cubs, that I understand. Um, but you know, they're on a hot streak. I mean, last I saw, a couple of days ago, I saw they have the they have the best record in the American League since the break. Not that it was fantastic, but I mean. Best record is best record. So, you know, hopefully they will uh, continue that push. Like you said, that's that's tough to jump over a few teams. But, you know, the Yankees are right back there, and, and they've got their – Yankees are going to be crazy good next year. I mean, look at the rookies they've got. So they could make the push. I mean, two and a half back is not too far back at this point. Like you said, the Royals – I don't care how many praying mantids they have. I mean, you're four back at this point. You got to jump like 80 teams. That's not going to happen. So, right. the Mets, the Mets is surprising because yeah, they were they looked done and now they're coming back strong. And Miami, they got Stanton back at least for pinch hitting duty. But I don't know at this point. They're five out. Uh, man, that's really tough. That's really tough, and especially when they're in a tailspin. So, it, it certainly looks like this point. Like the Cardinals, well, we know the Cardinals will be there because, again, it is in the NL bylaws, and the Mets, the Mets <laughs> certainly look good. I mean, everybody else, is, no one's over 500, other than other than the wild card teams, the the three that are that are looking at it, the Giants. Yeah, it's you know, it's wacky. It is, so I mean, anybody else, they've got a big jump. I mean, like you said, the Pirates are four and a half out, and they're the they're the next team up to maybe catch that spot and is like come on that's not going to happen so and and for the record the the 27 yankees actually went one and 11 against the 2016 cubs so you know just just saying. that would make sense yeah so you know stats daniel murphy still leads the national league in batting average at 345 dj lemehu is 342 for the uh, colorado rockies Corey seager is he's third he's way back but Corey seager is a rookie um, his projected stats as a rookie, 318, only 77 RBI because he bats higher in the order. 45 doubles, 28 home runs, um, slugging percentage of 536. Uh, Not bad. You know, yeah, for for a rookie, I, I got to, you know, as far as the Dodgers go, I'm a Dodgers fan, obviously. Uh, this is, you know, he's not only turned into a good player to start his career, he's turned into a very, you know, theoretically top 10 national league player to start his career six point war at this point in the season. So high hopes for the future for this kid. Uh, you know, he's going to be good. And then Charlie Blackman, it's, you almost have to throw out those Rockies guys, right? I mean, I know there are other home runs, but the batting averages are inflated as well. Yeah. I, I haven't looked at any of them specifically, but you know, historically very few of the Rockies players hauled up on the road anywhere close to what they do at home. So, yeah, I just kind of like, yeah, whatever. And home runs, Nolan Arenado has 37, Chris Bryant 36. Uh, you know, Chris Bryant is the player who we thought he was going to be. Mm-hmm. Chris Chris Carter of the Vikings has 33 home runs, uh, only 78 RBI, which is kind of weird. It's like, get on base, Brewers. Yeah, this guy would knock him. Adam Duvall of Cincinnati, 30 home runs. Uh, Chris Bryant's projected stats uh, for the rest of the season, if he plays a full fe- full season, only 106 RBI for 42 home runs, but I think that's because the Cubs are knocking in a lot of runs that this guy can't knock in. It's not like right. nobody's scoring. Um, he's also on pace for 131 runs himself, so and that's pretty impressive. And for a guy to hit 302, who was projected to hit what, what was he 280? A lot of people thought the high level to start his career at least. Um, you know that's pretty good. 
you know, Matt Kemp has 94 RBIs, so we should we should give it up for Matt Kemp. Is is he a the player he was originally with the Dodgers? No, but I mean, he's still he's still an okay player. Yeah, he's productive. Let me throw in quickly that um, since I cast aspersions on Rockies players, Charlie Blackman actually is better away. He's actually hitting uh, 317 instead of 318 away, but he's slugging 50 points higher away. His OPS at home is 889. OPS on the road is 929. So <laughs> uh, the, the biggest difference in the stats really is RBI, which, of course, that means because the rest of the team's not doing much. He's got 41 at home. And he only has 26 away. But, again, RBI is dependent on everybody else, uh, certainly as much as you. So uh, right. Blackman is doing doing the job away as well. So. I, okay, I take back everything I said about Matt Kemp. You know, he has 94 RBIs. Guess what his war is? Two. It's point. It's negative point eight. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> wow. Meaning that even if he has the 94 RBI, he's still worse than his replacement player. Wow. It's uh, it's uh, kind of shocking. So yeah, that is quite shocking. Yeah. Look at Arenado quickly, and you can talk about something interesting while I'm looking at his. Well, Mark yeah. Mark Trumbo in the American League leads the uh, American League with 41 home runs. Still a, one, uh, uh, a war of 1.4. So even with the 41 home runs and 98 RBI, you know he's not really not really helping this team so much. Right. Um, Brian Dozier of the Twins, 39 home runs for this guy. 92 RBI, hitting 278. Guess what his WAR is? 10. <laughs> no. Six point one. Wow, Six, I was going to guess five. Yeah. That's wow. Yeah, Six point one, I, and I think it helps if you're a center fielder, which is one reason Mike Trout's always going to have sure. a high WAR because of what they do defensively. If you're a good, really good defensive player, and he is, and then what you're doing with the bat, you know that helps with your WAR. And he's always sky high with the WAR. So right. to me, that that WAR is a good stat, but it also kind of throws things askew as well. Yeah, it's, it's like it's position dependent too. Uh, Nolan Arenado, the classic uh, Rockies player. He's uh, 318 at home, 270 away, slugging 661 at home, which is awesome. 496 on the road. OPS is one is 1.05, which is wow, at home. But it's 832 on the road, which 832 is pretty good, but it ain't 1.05. So yeah, he he fits, you know, much more the the typical Rockies players. Like oh my gosh, this guy's amazing. He's the MVP, and then he goes on the goes on the road, and it's like, well, he's a really good player, and and, yeah. and, and that's far and away the the typical case for Rockies players. So, not that I mean, that's where they play. It's not like they choose to be crappy on the road. And I'm not saying he's crappy, but the stadium obviously artificially inflates their stats almost every time. So, kind of makes you wonder what's wrong with Blackman at home. I mean, if he's that good away, it's like, dude, he should be like a, a total beast at home, like like Tulowitzki <laughs> always was. The park doesn't play to his strengths. It's kind of weird. Um, so let's take the top 10 players in war in Major League Baseball. You've got Mike Trout, who's far and away the best, 9.3. Mookie Betts, 7.8. Then you've got Jose Altuve, Chris Bryant, Josh Donaldson, Manny Mikado, Kyle Seeger, uh, Robbie Cano, Brian Dozier, and Nolan Arenado. What do all those players have in common? They're either second baseman, center fielders, or third baseman. Yeah. And then you've got Corey Seager, who's a shortstop. So to me, that throws it off. It's like first baseman. It's like, is he the best athlete on the team? No, but he's Freddie Freeman's number 13. He's 5.3. Adam Eaton is 12th. Adam Eaton is 12th. So you're saying you're going to have Adam Eaton over Carlos Correa? I mean, come on. Right. It's, it's, it's a skewed stat. And, and I know people who are sabermetrics, it's like, oh, no, it's not skewed. It's skewed to the position. There's no way – I mean, that makes the argument. It's skewed to the position. And even beyond that, you've got uh, – what Adam Eaton is a center fielder. Seager is a shortstop. Freddie Freeman's a first baseman. But then you've got Lindor, Pedroia. It's, it, the top 15, only one of them is not a uh, third baseman or uh, up-the-middle defensive player. So eh, it's skewed. It's skewed to me. Just want to throw that out. Skewed. So it's Skewed. And then in the U.S. Open, of course, things have happened, if you're listening to this on Saturday, that we aren't aware of. But we do have semifinals, Serena's into the semifinals. How shocked were you that Nishikori beat uh, uh, Andy Murray yesterday? 
or on Tuesday. <laughs> I was going to say, what day, what day is it? What week was it? That's pretty shocking. I mean, Ishikori has been... He's been in that second tier of guys who are just outside what used to be the big four for a few years now. Um, that is surprising, though, because it, it certainly looked like this was, if not for Joko, this was Andy Murray's year. I mean, the, the season he's had so far. So that's that's quite surprising. But that's that's tennis and that's sports. I mean, that's how Lorinka won. I mean, things happen. So, And Vavrinka's really one of the big four at this point. I mean, now, if, if you is. have a big oh, yeah. four, he is. Now he is, so. absolutely. But, yeah, that's. I mean, I was happy to see it. Not that I dislike Murray, but I, unless it's going to be Fed, because Fed is still probably my favorite player, or Joko, because Joko is very cool. And at this point, Nadal, I would just like to see Nadal win some tournament at some point, because it sucks how he's broken down for him. Um you know, which which basically basically I'm saying I I like all of the big four except for Murray, which is not really how it is. But uh, I just don't have any kind of particular feel for Murray, so you know, I'm glad to see it. I'm glad to see one of the other guys pop in. If it if 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 he had beaten uh, Joko, then it would have been kind of like, ah, oh, man, that sucks. But good but good for him. Yeah, Nishikori is a guy who's been made the finals in the U.S. Open. He he lost to Shilik. Um, it was a few years ago, right. two or three years ago. It feels like it was thousands of, ago, thousands of years ago at this point. But he's made the finals in this tournament, so he is familiar. Uh, Pliskova playing really, really well on the women's yeah. side. She's made her semis. Serena lost a set um, on Tuesday to Simona Halep. Um, so, you know, she is – it'll be interesting. I think she's still beatable, but it's going to take a, a really good effort to beat her. Um, I think the three ladies left – uh, Wozniacki and Serena, are, you know, I worry. I, don't worry about that relationship, but I, I think that Wozniacki and Serena are good friends off the court. One of the few players that Serena seems to be, or probably Wozniacki for that matter, seem to be really good friends with off the court. But it, maybe it's a matter of, you know, Wozniacki is not really a threat to Serena on the court. And, you know, and I don't think Wozniacki is going to beat Serena, so I think it's going to be one of those other two ladies um, on the men's side, yeah, I mean, Nishikori has, has a chance. Um, it's still Djokovic's because he's made it all the way to the finals at this point because everybody's, uh, you know, walked out of the tournament on him. Crazy. Nine um, sets. Yeah. Yeah. And he's actually already up two sets to love in the finals. <laughs> so a lot of people don't know that. So um, we're going to be joined by Russell Baxter in just a minute. But uh, before we're joined by Russell Baxter, we have one question. Uh, to ask each other, and that is Colin Kaepernick's jersey is now number one, right? Number one in sales? Number one in online sales, yeah. Does this surprise you? Yeah, it really surprises me. When uh, A week ago, it was number five in the NFL, and it's like, wow, that's interesting that people are being that supportive. And, and Because you see, obviously, we see a lot of people upset about him not standing, and now he's kneeling during the anthem, and, and a few more players here and there are are uh, doing that in support of that cause and in support of him. But so, yeah, I was, I was surprised that it was number five. I'm shocked that it's number one. It's cool. I think it's very cool that people are basically saying, we think this is, we appreciate your stance. Let's put it that way. And they're, they're voting with their wallets to do that. And it's great that he's donating all of the proceeds, all of his cut of it, uh, for the causes he's supporting. So, uh, yeah, it's surprising, but it's a, it, I think it's a great story. And right after this, we'll be joined by Russell Baxter. And we are happy, more than happy, to have Russell Baxter join us again. Russell, thanks for slumming with us. Slumming? Oh. <laughs> this is a high-quality show. You never, you, listen, you should never put yourself down, okay? But I understand that philosophy. It's the 11th commandment. Do unto yourself before others do unto you. Well, well, it's a great show now that you're on. Oh, okay. Uh, we're we're going to get right into it. I feel strongly both ways. Okay. <laughs> what, what do you think have been a couple of the biggest off-season stories so far? Well, pretty pretty interesting one that's still developing, and I, I, I think that's the Colin Kaepernick situation, which really has little to do with football and more towards a, a young man taking a stance and the reaction or overreaction to it, and now uh, you know we're seeing other athletes react to what he did. We're seeing uh, you know the promise of uh, donations, um, both on the uh, 
part of Kaepernick and the 49ers now. Um, sometimes you got to make a little noise. And isn't it interesting? He took a stand by sitting. <laughs> well put, well put. And that was a, a wonderful follow-up into the next question, of course. Regardless of how you feel, particularly about his stance, do you think athletes should use their fame to speak out on social issues? Um, see, I, I, when, when you say the word athlete, you know, I, I don't think of them as athletes. I think of them as they're people like we are, okay? They just happen okay. to be better athletically than we are. Um, slight, I think slight. people have to be themselves. Um, it, it, yes, do they, you know, do they get a spotlight? You know what? We're in a day and age, guys. Everybody gets a spotlight, okay? Why don't you go True. on Facebook and go live? Why don't you go on Twitter and do something this? You know, you can draw a lot of attention to yourself now, and you don't have to be an athlete, a movie star, a singer, uh, a bank robber, or, you know, take your pick. There's lots of ways to get attention. And it's so funny because in the Kaepernick situation, I don't think he did what he did was to get attention. It, you know, from all indications, he did it the week before. And he just so happened he got spotted this time sitting on the bench. And right. isn't it funny? It just kind of escalated this. First, it was the, the anger, which, you know... We're a knee-jerk society now, unfortunately. Um, and then the young man spoke for 15 or 20 minutes, and people began to understand. And then you saw what Jeremy Lane did and Eric Reed did um, and, you know, other people speaking out. And, uh, you know, I think the fun thing that's so interesting about the situation that strikes me is I hear people saying, why didn't you do this a couple of years ago during the Super Bowl? Well, I don't think we've ever been in as much turmoil as we've been in the last year when it comes to the uh, police situations and all that, it's really come to light. And now was maybe the t time for him to, he, that he discovered it as well. I agree. And people are definitely noticing it's like his Jersey's number one in online sales. Mm -hmm. So people are really noticing what he's saying. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point because now everybody, it, it seems like it's snowballing at this point, which is not a necessarily a bad thing. It's just, it's funny. As you mentioned, Russell, it's, it's a knee jerk reaction that we have in culture. And it's like high school teams are doing it. The, the entire Seahawks team might do it. It's, it's kind of funny how it's developing, but you know, yeah, it, you know listen, here's the, here's the bottom line. Okay. For me, at least we all learn, need to learn to be nicer to each other. Okay. You know, social media is supposed to be social, not anti-social. <laughs> Okay. Wow. And, Excellent you know, point. Some, some people use it as a weapon, and I don't understand that. For me, it's I had to put a statistic in 140 characters, so Twitter's great for me. <laughs> um, and it, you know, to me, it should be a ve a vehicle. You know, it's it's almost sadly it was created for one thing, and you know, it's 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 kind of like I, when I was young, and I'm in my latter 50s now. Cable TV was created for reception where I lived. I'm not kidding. I lived in an area in Pennsylvania. If you didn't have cable TV, you didn't get TV. Okay? Antenna didn't do you much good. And then cable TV morphed into something else. The internet was the same thing. The internet morphed from a communication line for the government and schools into something we can all use now. But that doesn't mean we should abuse it. Yeah, well said. Better said than I could say. So, you know, getting back to the the Play yeah, on let's talk some football, okay? <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> so more about Kaepernick. No, I'm just joking. So um, <laughs> do you think too many teams over the last several years are rushing rookie quarterbacks? Because we're all old enough to remember, well, we, you know, I was a Steelers fan in the 70s, and, and Todd is a little bit older than I am. Of course, Terry Bradshaw sat on the bench for, it felt like, 60 years but do you think too many teams are rushing rookie quarterbacks into action or is it the money that's involved or also and, and you know if you're a Cowboys fan for instance would you be excited about Dak Prescott being the starter forced into that role I think what you learn is there's no real rhyme or reason to it and I go back to the area you go back to as well the adage used to be used to be that it takes five years to develop an NFL starting quarterback I believe that adage is still true, okay? But free agency, impatience, money, uh, the changing of the rules, um, the way quarterbacks now play in college opposed to how they played in college. The, the, the passing game was not as prominent in the 60s, the 70s, even the 80s in college football as it is now. You see, unbelievable. I mean, there would be the occasional exception. San Diego State, BYU, 
um, you know, those teams out there. I mean, Oklahoma. what did Oklahoma do? Throw five passes a year? Yeah, pretty much. Nebraska? Um, the wish, you know, all those different things. So the the college game has developed, and now we expect the quarterbacks to come in here a little more polished. But isn't it interesting that these multi-dimensional quarterbacks come into the league, and the first thing some coaches do is put them in back in their college formations so they can get comfortable. That's why I was really intrigued, guys, last year with what the Titans did with Marcus Mariota. For the most part, he took snaps from center last year, not at the shotgun. They were grooming him to be a professional quarterback because ultimately, and that's not saying the pros don't use the shotgun, okay? But, uh, you know, you can remember other college quarterbacks, they were predominantly out of the shotgun. They never really learned how to play behind center. So to answer your question from 60 years ago, um, I just think there's impatience now. But we're impatient when it comes to our coaches. We're impatient when it comes to our players. You know, oh, he dropped the ball, a million tweets. Uh, that's pass interference, <laughs> two million tweets. Okay? So, you know, it, it's fun. I bring up a lot of social media here because that's kind of how we react to our game now. Um, you know, we sit there and our push our buttons and our, you know, our phones still have smoke coming out of them by the fourth quarter. So I still think – I'll give you two glaring examples where two guys had great years last year, career years, and they were in their fifth season. Andy Dalton, before he got hurt, and Cam Newton. Yeah, that, those are great examples. And, and and bringing up something else that just electrified social media and uh, a trade that happened. You know, the Vikings are a team that had hopes and still has hopes of making a deep playoff run. And uh, Teddy Bridgewater, uh, you know, catastrophic injury. Who knows how long he'll be out. Uh, Sam Bradford, who has seemingly played under 4,000 different uh, offensive schemes since coming into the league, is now the quarterback. Um, how well does he fit in with Minnesota? And is the team just as good with Bradford as they are with Bridgewater or just maybe slightly under? Well, listen, for the most part, Sam Bradford's ability hasn't been questioned. What's been questioned is when are we going to see him on the field? I mean, he didn't play a full 16-game season last year again. Remember, he had missed, he missed his last 25 games with the Rams, hence the trade. Um, he's with an offensive coordinator or a coach, Pat Shermer, who he's very, very familiar with. That was one of the part of the trades. I think the thing that people reacted the most about guys is how did they, how they give up a first round pick for him? Well, right. that's what desperation will do. And, and if you're really paying attention, that should tell you their concern about Teddy Bridgewater. Okay. Teddy Bridgewater didn't suffer a non-contact injury, which from all port reports was very gruesome. He didn't suffer it in April. He didn't suffer it in March. He suffered it in late August. So let's say, even if it was a regular torn ACL, let's take him a year from now. Where is he? It's late August. Training camp is over. The preseason is over. No OTAs. No offseason. This was a, I think this was a two-year contingency plan. And that's why the, the, the uh, conditional part of the second draft pick in 2018 is so important. And frankly... I don't think the, the Vikings wanted the, Sean Hill to be a 16-game starter. I'm not sure how comfortable they were with that. So every who this really fell into line with was the Philadelphia Eagles, okay, who really did want Carson Wentz to be the starter. And suddenly you put a little back teen on those ribs, and all of a sudden he's starting this week um, against <laughs> the Browns. And Chase Daniel is, you know, the backup again. But that's still a good thing for Doug Peterson. And the Philadelphia Eagles, remember who gave up? I think they gave up uh, William Penn, 20 cheese steaks, and some cream cheese uh, to, to the Browns, okay, are hosting the draft next year and now have a first-round draft pick again. <laughs> cream cheese. The cream cheese was the kicker. I think that's what sealed the deal. I could have gotten into the whole pretzel debate if you've ever had a pretzel from New York opposed to Philadelphia. To me, there's no comparison, but I know we're pressed for time. <laughs> let's, let's continue with football Seahawks they have 15 rookies on the roster of course they still have a lot of experienced talent uh, having so many rookies to start the season though are they taking a big chance on early success and the, therefore you know they're they're seeding in a playoff or, or does it really matter because the season ends differently than how it began yeah I think you hit the nail on the head and you also have a coach in Pete Carroll who listen still not that far removed listen Pete Carroll's coached in the pros 
and he's coached in the NFL with great success. And I think he likes the idea of having young players. I mean, they have really churned guys out. I mean, you, you know, you think about some of their stars, okay? Russell Wilson's a third-round pick. Richard Sherman's a fifth-round pick. Cam Chancellor's a fifth-round pick. That's not the same. They don't have uh, the Earl Thomases and some of the other prominent guys as well. You know, Pete Carroll, I think, is an excellent teacher of the game of football. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how this team is by the end of the year because that's what's most important. And listen, we saw that, remember, the Seahawks last year were an 0-2 football team, okay? Uh, right. They seemed like they were mediocre, and they got hot at the end of the year. They won the Super Bowl. They got hot um, after a shaky year in 2014, and then they lost the Super Bowl. And last year, they were playing terrific football down the stretch. The more concern with me with Seattle is not so much how young these guys are, but do they have five guys who can block? And when I say five guys, I'm not talking about the hamburger chain. <laughs> exactly. I do want to make sure that we, we give Lee credit because that was his brilliant question, not mine. Well, that's um, all right. As long as I get a food reference in, we're solid. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move to New England and see what kind of favorites they have up there. Uh, the Patriots, of course, they seem to do consistently better than everyone else, no matter what's going on. Um <clears throat> What is it that they, how do they manage to do this? They, they're always on the team right there at the edge of, if not going to the Super Bowl. I, I think Bill Belichick has perfected the art of free agent football. Um, and what he's really perfected is situational football. And that's why with Jimmy Garoppolo in for the next four games, you're still not going to know what, listen, when New, Tom Brady's the quarterback, you don't know what the game plan is going to be. Are they going to come out and throw the ball the first 25 plays of the game? Would they do something like that? Absolutely. Would they come out and throw, run the ball the first 25 plays of the game? Absolutely. So, you know, you're going to get the same thing with Jimmy Garoppolo. Um, it's situational football, and he'll be put in situations that will take advantage of what he can do and certainly take advantage of what he can't do. So who knows what the game plan is going to be? I mean, is he going to come in here and throw for 500 yards on the Arizona Cardinals? I don't think that'll happen. Um, I, but I think it's interesting because you see, you get a sense almost that the Patriots who play this game against the Cardinals Sunday night on the road, and then they play three straight home games, it's almost, you kind of get the sense that the people are resigned to the Pats being three and one, which I think is still very, very possible. But don't be shocked if they pull a little surprise on Sunday night against the Cardinals. And we know you're not really a fan of making predictions, especially when the season hasn't even started. But four teams. What are the four teams you think will have the best chance of just making it? Well, to, listen, to if we're game? at that stage now of I, I, my Super Bowl pick is out there. OK, so. Um, so when you say four teams, are you talking about who I think will be the best four teams or? Yeah, best four teams. Best don't even worry teams. about I don't, you know, I, I'm going to automatically pencil New England into the AFC Championship game because they've been there five straight years, so why not make it six, okay? Right. Um, over in the NFC, I like the Seattle Seahawks this year. Um, I think they're more diverse on offense. I think the defense is still great. They've led the league in fewest points allowed four years in a row. That hasn't happened in the National Football League since the mid-50s um, when the Cleveland Browns did it five years in a row. Um, and I'm going to take a little flyer on the Houston Texans, who will become the first team to host the Super Bowl and play in it the same year. And I just love the irony of that, guys, because we've been waiting 51 years for a home team in the Super Bowl. <laughs> so I decide to pick the team that joined the league last. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. But all, all seriousness, the defense was third in the league last year. Still right. spotty at times, but I think maybe Divi and Clowney wakes up this year. J.J. Watt, I mean, listen, he could be Venus de Milo with no arms. He's still going to play, <laughs> okay? But look right. what they did on offense. And by the way, Bill O'Brien's a hell of a quarterback coach. That's why I think Brock Osweiler went there. In the draft, they got Will Fuller and Braxton Miller. So uh, DeAndre Hopkins isn't lonely anymore, okay? But the guy who they got in free agency still has a lot of tread on the tire, is Lamar Miller, and I think he's going to have a monster year. I think he could be AFC, I'm sorry, NFL Offensive Player of the Year. And uh, I, I look for Seattle to get back to the Super Bowl for the 
uh, you know, is it? I think I think Arizona slips a bit this year. I don't know if I'd slip them out of the playoffs, but I think they slip. I could see a Seattle Green Bay rematch uh, in the NFC title game, and you know maybe the Packers will be up thirty to nothing this time <laughs> and give up four fake field goals or whatever. Um, but uh, you know, I got Houston over Seattle in Super Bowl Fifty One, or as I like to refer to it, Super Bowl Long Island. <laughs> Well, as a lifelong Dolphins fan, Houston, you're welcome for the extra 6,000 yards that Lamar Miller has in his career that we didn't use. Yeah, uh, and you see, that's the thing. I'm not big on running back ages. How many, time, how many times, oh, he's a running back, he turned 30, he's starting to slow down. What, 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 you play on Monday night, the clock turns midnight, and, you're, and you, you go back into a pumpkin? doesn't work <laughs> that way. Being a football player, being an athlete is about tread on the tire. And Lamar Miller, even though he was busier the first two years in Miami, the, I mean the last two years in Miami, than he was the first two years in Miami, they did not give him the ball a lot. So you combine that with no. the fact that he's still 25 years old and he has four years of experience in this league. And I know the Houston Texans were sick of seeing him last year. And the irony of ironies was the game where he scored on two long touchdowns. And meanwhile, Arian Foster tears his Achilles in Miami. So now Lamar Miller's with the Texans, and where's Arian Foster? The Miami Dolphins. It's a funny league. It's full of yucks. It, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> Russell, you, you are fantastic as always. We know you've got to run because you have seven other shows to do tonight. Uh, let our listeners know where they can find you. Oh, first things first. I have to do other shows, but I, if you've seen me, you know I'm not running. Okay. <laughs> um, you can find me on Bax Football Guru on Twitter. If you follow me on Twitter, be ready for a barrage of football information from, you know, radio podcasts and radio shows like I'm happy to do with you guys. And it's fun to talk football with you to stats, to pieces I do for NFL Spin Zone and NFL Fan and Fan Side It. Um, so that's it's a one stop shopping. But there's ProFootballGuru.com. There's Pro Football Guru on Instagram. There's Pro Football Guru on Facebook. I'm doing something new with Facebook, by the way, guys. I'm doing, like, some team pages. So if you're a Patriots, a Packers, or a Cowboys fan, you can follow those pages that I've done as well. And, um, you know, awesome. off my latest appearance with Good Morning Football, I don't know if you've caught the show on the NFL Network for the last month. They're doing a great job. Uh, Kay Adams and Nate Burleson and Kyle Brandt and Peter Schrager – I am a participant in something called the Nerd Bowl. And uh, <laughs> if you check out my Facebook page, my Pro Football Guru Facebook page, or anywhere else on Twitter, you'll see the results. We did it. We did a show this morning. It was a lot of fun. Peter's a great sport. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll give you a tip if you watch the video. I want my own robe. <laughs> Russell, thank you again. You're terrific, as always. And enjoy the game tonight. I like Denver tonight, by the way, in case you're interested. Wow. We like it. Yeah, well, I mean, everybody talked about Trevor Simeon. Did anybody really decide that who was going to block Von Miller and DeMarcus Ware tonight? Yeah, good point. Good point. Not Cam. <laughs> uh, no, no. No, it they, they should be a fun game. We don't get, hey, listen, it's the first time in 46 years the two teams who played in the Super Bowl open the season against each other. Okay? I mean, this is a, this is something rare. We haven't seen this since the merger, since the Chiefs and the Vikings played in Super Bowl four, and then they opened the season against each other. So this is kind of cool. This is kind of neat. But, you know, if you're a Denver Broncos fan, you might want to have a program. Since since the birth of Lee. <laughs> true. That's true, actually. <laughs> it's a commemorative game just for you, Lee. There you go. <laughs> Thanks again. See? Thanks again, Russell. All right, guys. Have a great night. Thanks again. To uh, Russell Baxter for being on. Russell is always fantastic, and we're lucky to have him on because he's a guest on more important shows than ours. So before we're joined by uh, the wonderful Sharona in, in just a couple of minutes, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the Vikings and the Eagles trade. It's funny, but as the NFL season moves on with all these roster cuts, it's almost it's like old news about uh, Bradford and uh, going to the to the Vikings from the Eagles and the Eagles starting all over. You know, I'll, I'll say this about your Dolphins, or I'll ask this about your Dolphins. Anything that really showed up that surprised you as far as the roster cuts? No real surprises on the roster cuts. What surprises me is that the defense has looked um, inept at times in the in preseason. That's 
that's surprising, and hopefully that shakes out. Roster cuts, I didn't really see many big surprises. Other than, again, I think they're carrying 27 running backs. That's interesting. Are you are you concerned, though, by the preseason? Because that doesn't really mean anything, right? I mean, your team can look really bad in the preseason. It doesn't really mean anything, right? I'm concerned that that they don't really look like they're gelling. You know, I mean, they did against Atlanta, but who knows how good Atlanta is. That doesn't really mean much, you know, looking good in one game because – they look terrible. Like the defense, the number one defense, did not look good against the Cowboys. Um, it, we'll we'll find out. Obviously, we'll find out a lot Sunday because, man, a, a, as the tired cliche goes, they they better all bring their lunch buckets playing the Seahawks in Seattle. So yeah, I'm really concerned about the defense. I'm I'm actually less concerned about the O line and the running game because. I don't hold out great hopes for it, but I didn't expect much from that. You know, that's the issue is, is to me, is how good is the defense going to play? Uh, Tannehill, if Tannehill gets time, he's terrific. If he doesn't get time, he's terrible. I mean, that's all there is to it. So if the O-line protects him, he can have a good season like he did in 2014. He was a top-10 quarterback in 2014. He had more time. 2015, he didn't. He was terrible. Or Really bad. Let's put it that way. He wasn't terrible, but he was pretty bad. So yeah, the only lane's got to perform. But I mean, those are question marks we expected. The, the the defense is not supposed to be a question mark. So we'll we'll see how they perform. Yeah, and John Clayton had a question on seven ten ESPN Seattle just about uh, Sue, and you know he he mentioned that he was a great dominant player, but he worried about how he worked with the other two people on his uh, you know on his line or the other three people right. but and we now welcome another great guest and uh, beyond Russell Baxter who we had on earlier but Sharona has has been a frequent guest but not frequent enough for us on the show over the years um Sharona is the host of Back Talk with Sharona so Sharona how are you I'm great how are you um, we're doing okay. We're doing okay. So, you know, obviously week one of the NFL season is mm-hmm. coming up, and everybody in their own little camp, who whatever team they follow, is going to be must-see. But uh, generally speaking, what games are in week one are must-sees for you? Oh, there's a lot of great um, a lot of great games out there. Um, obviously, the it's kind of interesting that the Thursday night game really – um, and by, by the time you play this, it will have been um, concluded. But it's not getting as much hype as what you would expect. And even the two teams don't, you know, really seem to be all that excited about it. And, of course, it's a rematch of um, you know, Super Bowl 50. And uh, it, it's just weird, um, obvious, for obviously, for for reasons that are pretty clear. I'm interested in the Minnesota Tennessee game. I think that's um, that's going to be a great matchup. It's really going to, I think, tell us a lot about those um, those two teams. Bills Ravens. I'm I'm really interested in that game. I want to see how the Bills look. You know, they had have had a lot. They were a team that I was high on going into the off season. They've had a lot of injuries, but they've also you know picked up some players too. I think that's going to be a good game. Bengals Jets. I think that's going to be a really um, good game to watch. Dolphins Seahawks. Are the Dolphins for real? Uh, it's hard for me to buy into them. I'm interested to see what the Seahawks look like in in, in the regular season. Giants Cowboys. It's always a good. Um, you know, that's a rivalry. Always a good conference. You know, division division match. Let's see what else. Um, and then of course Patriots Cardinals. I guess would be the other one that that I'm really interested in. Yeah, that's that's and that's going to be an interesting matchup for nationally because the Cardinals and the Patriots are both expected to be good, but there's no mm-hmm. Tom Brady, so it'll be interesting to see if Cardinal mm-hmm. or the Patriots actually lose that game. So, you know, a, a team that has moved uh, the Rams, Jared Goff is inactive for mm-hmm. Week One. Is this mm-hmm. really a blow uh, for the Rams, or are they just uh, you know handling a rookie correctly and that he shouldn't be starting? the first game of his first season, or on the opposite side of that, is it really just Todd Gurley's team for the next several years, and he is the difference between the team winning or losing? Well, I think all of that's true. <laughs> you know, certainly Todd Gurley is um, the the best 
certainly the best offensive player that they have. Uh, Jared Goff did not look ready. He looked awful, actually, during the preseason. Uh, I think it's the correct decision not to play him, making him inactive. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, Their quarterback situation is interesting. Jeff Fisher just got, um, didn't he just get extended? How he manages. I mean, how he managed, we should all be Sam Bradford and Jeff Fisher in our next life. That's all I, I That's right. So, um, I, you know, I expect the Rams to do, the Rams are going to ram. The, if they, they'll, they'll be 8-8 eight and eight maybe, um, you know, maybe 6-10. and ten. They're not going to be very good, in my opinion. Um, I'm not, I, I, I don't even know that I'll watch that game. Is that the Monday night game? No, what game is that? Uh, that's one. Of, yeah, it's one of the Monday night games. Um, you know what? I might actually watch it because I am interested in the 49ers. And again, we are speaking with the fabulous Sharona. Uh, a little more in like in game talk. Uh, kickers. A lot, a lot of kickers have said we're going to see a lot of mortar kicks. You know, the high kicks, a lot of hang time in response to the touchback move. Now it's going to be at the 25. How do you see this playing out? I mean, they've been moving away from making the special teams or um, have been traditionally, you know, kind of like the third aspect of the game. And that's been changing. You know, they've made a lot of moves in terms of the extra point and and, and all of that. And so I think teams have kind of gone away from, you know, really relying on, um, you know, the, the return game as um, – you know, as a huge aspect of the game, what impact it's going to have, um, you know, for the teams that, you know, maybe have relied on uh, using their return game to get them in better position for their offense to, you know, to do well. I mean, it might, and not can't call any team like that. Well, maybe Seattle. I mean, Tyler Lockett is the, guy that comes to my mind when I think of great returnability and right you know at, at this point but I, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact in my opinion I just don't I, I don't see it and a little more in your your neighborhood the Titans they seem to be improving they're mm-hmm. still not picked to win even half the games by a lot of the pundits how's the city of Nashville reacting to this year's squad and how good can they be in two or three years well I think that they're better um I it, I think we've seen indication. I don't pay much attention to pundits, so um, I'm actually not sure what. I mean, I know that um, you know I play a lot of fantasy football, and I know that for a pretty good while, you could get a lot of their players on the cheap. And um, as the preseason progressed, that became less and less true. So um, you know, I think people are cluing into to the fact that you know, hey, their offense might be pretty good. The defense is, to me, the the bigger concern. I think the front seven is going to be fine. The secondary is still very much a work in progress. I predicted them to win um, at least six games. I think they'll win, you know, around six games. If they go eight and eight, I think that that's a great season for them um, because the last couple of years they've won, you know, two. Within three games, it's not been very good in terms of what the. I think people are cautiously optimistic. You know, um, they looked good in, in in the preseason. They made a lot of changes. It's a new regime. I think most people like, as a general rule, like what John Robinson, the new general manager, has done. Um, not quite as sold as not say me personally, but the fan base is not quite sold on Mike Malarkey. Um, They weren't terribly excited about that. He hasn't had a lot of success. I'm probably one of the few that like him um, more than than most people. But uh, I think that they are cautiously optimistic. And, you know, and if they can, um, and I know it it sounds weird, you know, six games, wow. But, I mean, that's a lot for this team when you look at the past couple of years. So am I the only one old enough here to think when I when I hear the name John Robinson being the general manager of the Titans that oh that's the guy who used to coach USC football right <laughs> so anyway he's not but uh, yeah that's what I think every time I hear that one on on sports talk radio shows so we don't like to use the word elite on this show a lot because Ted <laughs> Todd and I and and Ted's wife doesn't even rank him in the top five of anything but Ted Todd and I have 
never been in that category in anything we do, but who do you see as the best five or six best quarterbacks in the NFL to start this season? Uh, Aaron Rodgers, to me, is the best quarterback in the league right now it's in, in terms of pure quarterbacking, uh, you know, the the p- purely playing the position. Cam Newton is um, just an unstoppable force. Uh, Tom Brady, you have to put Tom Brady, even though you know he's suspended for the first four games. Um, Russell Wilson, I think, is in easily in the top ten, if not the top five. How many is that? How many have I given you? Four? Um, let me think here. Uh, I, I think Carson Palmer is a very very good quarterback. You, uh, would I put him in the top five? Probably not. He'd make my top ten. Um, the concern, obviously, with him is, is whether or not he can stay healthy. Uh, you know, Ben Roethlisberger, he's a solid quarterback, a guy who's going to um, – always going to – uh, give you know full effort and in with him behind center you're always going to have a chance Andrew Luck would probably be my my fifth one except I mean I'm hesitant because he has such a bad year and he, he's back on the injury report Drew Brees I guess Drew Brees would be the five I'm, I'm kind of scrolling down real quick I guess Drew Brees would be my fifth um, and then Andrew Luck I think you you have to put him in there um RG3 looks good. He'd probably make my – he'd be around 10 for me, 10 or 11, I guess. I I, I like Alex Smith. I think that um, he gets a lot of criticism um, unwarranted. You know, Tony Romo's an interesting guy. He's not going to be playing, um, at least early on, how bad is his back. It sounds to me like it's pretty bad. If I, I mean, if I were Tony Romo's wife, I would be like, baby <laughs> – might be time to be thinking about, you know, because you want him to play with his kids and stuff. I don't know. Um, well, I, I, Eli Manning would not probably make my top ten. So, Yeah, it's it's interesting because Tony Romo, a lot of people like to give him a hard time, but he's really the difference in that team making the playoffs or not. I mean, he's a good quarterback. Has been. Yes, yeah, he has been. Has and, been. Um, you know, I, you you had to like what you saw out of Dak Prescott, and I saw a lot of Dak Prescott in college, you know, in the SEC, and I was always a fan, and I really liked his game, and, you know, I'm happy for yeah. him. I think that he's landed in a great spot, and he's going to get a, a, a prime opportunity to, um, you know, to shine. They've, they've got a great offensive line. They should have a pretty good running game. They've got some good wide receivers. You know, I'm I'm interested to see him this year. Yeah, if he does well enough, it could be that we don't ever really see Romo as a starter again, just because not, of his oh, health, not yeah. because of his ability. Exactly, exactly. So are there some dark horse teams that, well, maybe even the Titans, if they get the <laughs> running game, because they have good running backs, but are there some dark horse teams that, that you see possibly getting to the playoffs this year? Well, I think you have to look to the AFC South um, for your dark teams. And, you know, and maybe, I don't know, maybe the AFC, you know, the AFC in general, I think, because it's been a little bit more down in terms of um, overall strength. I- I'm curious to see if the Jaguars can finally, with um, Gus Bradley, finally get over that hump and and be the team that, you know, it looked like they could be for the last couple of years. You know, there are no excuses left in Jacksonville. It is their year to compete for the AFC South. Um, I think that they'll probably be comp- competing with Houston. I just don't – I'm not excited about what the Colts did over the off season, and, you know, with the way they looked last year. I just, you know, it's hard for me to believe in them this year. <clears throat> uh, I think I mentioned the Bills. I really like what, what the Bills – uh, you know what they have done. I've, I've got the standings pulled up because so I just made my NFL predictions. Um, I mentioned the Bills. I picked the Chiefs to win the AFC West. That may surprise a lot of people. I like what the Raiders are doing. I just still think they're another year away. I didn't. I did not predict them to to be a wild card. Some people did, um, and I think they've got a fantastic young quarterback. And I think that they're they look good. But I, so far, the Chargers are awful. Um, <laughs> and the AFC North, I picked the Steelers. I, the Browns may be a surprise team. I really like what RG3 looks like. Um, Hugh Jackson's a great coach, and he's going to coach that team up. And 
uh, you know, they uh, I would put them on the list. I don't know if you would say they're a surprise because they're getting a little bit of hype. Talked about the AFC South. Uh, I don't think the Giants are going to do anything. The Eagles, they're not. I picked the Redskins to win the NFC East. I don't know if that's a surprise or not. The NFC West, that's the Cardinals to, to lose. I'm sorry, Seahawk fans. Um, I picked <laughs> Fit you as a wild card. NFC North, that's the Packers. And I picked the Vikings, even though um, they lost their quarterback. I just love Mike Zimmer. You know, I love him, Coach Zim, Team Coach Zim. I think he will coach them up. I think that um, despite losing Teddy Bridgewater and his injury is extremely concerning to me, uh, I think that they'll still be a good team. We'll know more about that this weekend when they play Tennessee. And let's see, in the NFC South, I think it's the Panthers. I picked the Panthers to win the Super Bowl. I was look, I was looking for the mute button when you had Cardinals win the a- a- NFC West. I was like, <laughs> what's the mute? I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So, uh, you know, beyond football, what do you think about Colin Kaepernick not standing for the national, not only him, but Jeremy Lane, for instance, of the Seahawks and possibly more Seahawks in that first game, not standing for the national anthem? Well, I think that um, Colin Kaepernick's um, journey is fascinating to me. And um, if you if you had been paying, <clears throat> excuse me, paying attention to his social media presence, you knew that he was becoming more socially conscious. Now, I don't always agree with Colin Kaepernick. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you know, some of the things I mean, like, dude, but he's definitely right in that um, we we are living in a time where there's a lot of evidence that the the words liberty and justice for all are hollow and meaningless. And I don't think that there is liberty and justice for all. And I think it's important that we as humans and as Americans um, stand up and and talk about these things, because if we don't, things will never change. And if you have a platform like Colin Kaepernick, what good is it if you don't use it to bring awareness, to do good? You know, dead men can't speak. And, you know, the dead bodies laying in the streets, they can't speak. And and so I admire, you know, I applaud um, what Colin Kaepernick and, and these other uh, men and women are, are doing. And if you t- talk to the overwhelming majority of service members that I've spoken with have been supportive of it. Well, Sharona, I was going to uh, hang up on you since you totally dissed uh, my Miami Dolphins and you clearly, clearly think Ryan Tannehill is like the 37th best quarterback in the league. But uh, I'm not sold on Ryan Tannehill. Uh, I think this is a big year for him. <laughs> if he does not show that he is, um, you know, I mean, he had a hard hill to climb. He was overdrafted, right. in my opinion. Um, but this is his year. He's got to show it this year. Oh, I agree. He's, he's got a what is reputed to be an excellent offensive coach and he's he's yes, being tutored exactly. by a couple guys who know how to play the position manning and marino so yeah if he doesn't do it this year he, he's he's to, he needs to be yes. toast okay. uh, moving on to football and by the way love your answer on kaepernick uh you. you talked about some of the dark horses uh four teams who are the four teams that have the best chance to make the super bowl and who's going to win the big oh i said super bowl dog on it now we're all with the money <laughs> who's, who's going to win the big game I picked Carolina um, to, uh, to to mow through the NFC. I, I just think they, um, you know, they made mistakes in, in the Super Bowl. I, they did not seem to be uh, prepared for the um, the blitz that is, you know, chose that word more deliberately. Mm. The, the Denver defense that was one of the best defenses I've ever seen, and, and um, they did not seem to be prepared for it. It seemed to te- you know kind of take them off their game, but I still like them as a team. They get Kelvin Benjamin back. Devin Funches has got a, a year under his belt. They've got a lot of nice young talent on the on that football team. If I were concerned about anything, it would probably be their run game. I love Jonathan Stewart. Can he stay healthy? Who's behind him? I know they have Mike Talbert. Um, beyond in the NFC, beyond that, I mean Green Bay is always going to give you your money's worth, and then some. I love Arizona. If Carson Palmer can stay healthy, Uncle Bruce is a fantastic coach. They've got so much talent on that team. 
Um, I, I came very close to picking Arizona in in the NFC, and then um, and then I guess Seattle would be the other team in the AFC. Uh, it's the Patriots, you know. I mean, it's it's the Patriots to win or lose, I guess. Although I, I really like, um, you know, I like the Chiefs. I like Pittsburgh this year. Um, I think Pittsburgh is, um, you know, is a good team. Now, certainly the loss of Martavius Bryant and um, not being without um, Le'Veon Bell for a couple of games, two, what, three games, I think is what his uh, – suspension ended up being that I mean that certainly hurts you don't lose a, a player like that but they're still loaded and I, I, I think D'Angelo Williams will man that spot quite well uh, you know I, I'm so curious to see what the Bills and Jets do I really um, I, I love the Jets coach Ken Ryan Fitzpatrick put together two two good years in a row that's right. certainly a concern but they've got their defense is so good and they've got a, they've got some nice young talent too I mentioned the Chiefs um, the Steelers we talked about I mean the AFC South is the wild card right I mean I don't see any team coming out of the AFC South this year and making too much noise but you know maybe in a couple of years yeah, there's a lot of questions there. And again, thank you for not mentioning the Miami Dolphins. You never mentioned the entire division. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, I feel I feel about the same as you do about the Dolphins. I'm not at all sure. Uh, <laughs> moving on to college and the only team in college football that matters, the Tennessee Vols. Uh, the fans, they're kind of like the mayor in the nightmare before Christmas. You know, they're, they're full of hope and joy one minute, and then they switch to the other face, and then they're depressed because, oh, we barely squeaked out against Happy State. So what are your hopes well, for the Vols this year? Oh, go ahead. No, this coaching staff makes us schizophrenic because <laughs> of what they do. And, you know, I mean, the Tennessee, and they and they should have been hyped up. I'm sorry if you're upset about that. They've got a lot of talent on that team. Yes, they do. But they've had talent before. <clears throat> and the reason why they have not performed better, in my opinion, is coaching. And... I was prepared to drink all the orange Kool-Aid in the world, and then we get to last Thursday night, and the team just was utterly unprepared, just completely and utterly unprepared and not ready to face Appy State. And maybe they just didn't game plan for it. And there, there were reports that they played everything was vanilla. They played right. vanilla, and they were preparing for. That's I'm sorry. That's not that's not to me. That's not a successful formula. That's what you I'm ask you play the of- game. You play the game in front of you, and you don't look ahead. And that, and 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 if you talk to, him, I bet you Bill Belichick would never do that. He would never overlook an opponent. Ever. You, you can't. And that was a lot of talk. Was that it was you know they had a vanilla game plan because they're looking ahead. And like you said, you cannot look ahead yeah. against anybody, especially against a team that was what eleven and two. I and mean, then you, they came out yeah, yesterday and said, "Oh well, we're going to run this new." fangled exotic no huddle defense and i was like uh guys it doesn't work that way so i don't know it's just you know i'm i'm going to go into the rest of the season with zero expectations and just let the chips fall where they may well that was my question what are your hopes for the season and apparently you think that they definitely were overrated to start off at number nine I was happy to see them getting accolades and with everybody being excited about, um, um, you know, the season and the possibilities. I just, you know, um, I, I'm i still not sold. Gotcha. So you're not, uh, you don't want to make any predictions about if they can take the East? They should compete in the East. If they can't take the East this year, um, Bitch Jones needs to be on the hot seat. Wow, that's that's awesome. That's an awesome take. Because I was thinking, you know, you, I understand there's a whole lot of hype going into the season, and you know, the team, as you mentioned, has tons of talent. But and I know that they said, oh, you know, after the fact, oh, we we're kind of being vanilla, or people have said they're being vanilla, but they came out flat. That's awesome. And it's the first game of the season. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how you can undersell that. I mean, they did not look prepared. They didn't look like um, a team that was ready for the season to start. They did not look – they certainly didn't look worthy of being the number nine team in the nation. And 
Yeah, and that's – and sorry, Todd, but you mentioned that, that Bill Belichick, who, who's an NFL coach, but even going back to college, does does Nick Saban win this game 20-13? to 13? I mean, does Urban Meyer win this game 20-13? to 13? No. Right. No. Dabo Sweeney doesn't win this game 20-13 to 13 in overtime. Yeah, and I hate to agree, but that's – not that I hate to agree with you guys, but, I mean, yeah, that's – Wish Bush Jones all the all the best, but uh, that's something that comes back time and again to him is the in game coaching. It's like there are some games where you have to wonder. So hopefully, hopefully uh, this was this <laughs> was a, this was a hiccup. Yeah, fingers yeah. and toes crossed. But but my gosh, we'll, we'll know a lot more when they're going up against Virginia Tech. But that was a huge drop. I mean, no other team that won had nearly as big a drop. I mean, to drop from ninth to seventeenth in the rankings. Mm-hmm. And, they take care of business. It doesn't make it matter if they're seventeenth. They'll, they'll be where Listen, they need poll, to be. But wow! Yeah, preseason polls are worthless, and really, we right. won't have a good idea what's going on in college football until week four. But um, they deserve to drop, and you know, I don't pay a lot of attention to polls anyway. But yeah, I mean, um, they deserve to drop, and now you know maybe they can. Um, they'll uh, come out like um, a team that's ready to dominate. Yeah, hopefully they'll come out this time like they in the Battle of Bristol like they should have last week. Yeah, Sharona, you were fantastic as always. Thank uh, you. Tell our listeners where you can be found and why they should listen to you and what, how they can listen and all those good things. Well, the best way to keep up with me is to follow me on Twitter at Sports by Sharona. You can check out my podcast, Bat Talk with Sharona, and um, I'm writing this year for Inside the Pylon. I had had a couple of articles drop there, so check them out as well. You know, uh, we again, thank Sharona and Russell Baxter for being on. Uh, great guests, NFL preview shows, so we'll make our own predictions. Without Ted, because he's refused, I take that back. We've muted him the yes, entire show. Um Gotta keep those people in their corner. <laughs> what? What did I say? Those people in yes. their corner. Yes, is that better? That's much better. Thank you. Thank you. So, who, who's your prediction as far as rookie of the year in the National Football League Zeke. of America? Okay, Zeke. Zeke is an excellent uh, choice. Zeke is in a football term. That's always the guy oh, yeah. you want to go with because Zeke is, is yeah. Zeke is amazing. Um, I'll say this. I, I think it's going to be. Um, I think it's going to be Tom Brady. <laughs> I think that's going to be there. Where Why did this kid laughing? come from? He starts yeah. playing in so, October and is like, what the hell? Where's this guy then? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so Tom Brady. Um, wildest thing to happen in the NFL this season. Uh, Dak Prescott you. will finish second in Rookie of the Year. Uh, I, then I'll go with that. Wildest thing to happen in the NFL this season, Dak Prescott is your Super Bowl MVP. So MVP of the season, um, who do you think? MVP, wins that? I'm actually going with Derek Carr. I like uh, I like what he's doing out in Oakland, and Oakland I think will be a su- fairly surprising team this year. And I'm going to go with Lamar Miller. I think he's going to be the MVP of the league this season. So you're <laughs> saying, <laughs> because now he's playing with a team that understands running backs run the ball. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's right. So uh, these obviously are ridiculous <laughs> predictions. So uh, su- Super Bowl teams, who, who are your two uh, and who wins? I have Oakland going to – I don't have them winning the division, but I have them going in as a wild card. And you'll hate this, but I do have Seattle going in, and I have Seattle winning. Okay. That's fair enough. And I have Oakland versus the Chargers, and I think <laughs> that Oakland wins the Super Bowl. What's so funny about that? What? That's, so uh, anyway, that's – they won't make it. No way they'll make it. They could make it against Oakland, maybe. Oh, wait. They won't make it. They're in the same division, which means they're in the same conference. Let me rethink this. Hmm. I think it's the Jets and the Dolphins. I like that and a lot, except then you're going to say that the uh, the Jets will win, so now I hate you again. I think the Dolphins win. I think the Dolphins win, but I think Dak Prescott is the MVP. On, the, on that show that we like, the, the four-letter network, as Ted Oz calls it, because he's a major proponent of Fox and Friends because he's on that show constantly and never invites us to come on, they uh, they had the two guys with the same names, and they were talking about blah, 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 who's going to go. And the larger gentleman stated that he's not as large as he used to be, but he's still larger than the chess guy. He uh, stated that he believes that Carolina will win, and that you know that that would be the first team – to win a Super Bowl the year after they lost the Super Bowl since 
the Miami Dolphins of 1972. That's crazy that it's been that long. It has. I mean, there's been teams that have gone back to back and lost. And lost yeah, the next but year. that hasn't happened since the Bills. According to what they well, said. The, no, the Seattle, Seattle no, went back lie. to back. No, that lost. That lost <laughs> a game and then went back. No, that's what I'm saying. It's been a while since the team won and then yeah, lost. I'm the saying next it's been a while since the team back. that lost. And I'm saying, God damn it, <laughs> that it's been many years since John Q. Adams, the greatest uh, quarterback in the history. He was of a hell of a football. quarterback. So he was a hell of a quarterback. Yeah, a lot of people don't. They, you know, they don't give. When New York played South Carolina in that 1895 Super Bowl, a lot of people don't give him enough credit. I mean, he did his best, and South Carolina won. Of course, you know, Daniel Morgan. Um, so anyway, <laughs> hell, how's the show ending? I'm not sure. Uh, Daniel Morgan did the greatest mic drop in the history of the United States of America because not only was he like, come a little bit further with Nathaniel Green, right? And we'll lead these, uh, you know, these British troops into cow pens and we'll kind of lead them around. And, and then Daniel Morgan's like, this is what we should do, split up. And then they split up, and the British thought they were following oh. both of them. They're following one of them. How much did you have to drink? And then, how much did you have to drink? For and the then show? Daniel Morgan's like, not only bitches, did you think that Nathaniel Green was by himself? You ran over this hill, and we just we just won the fucking South for the uh, United so the colonies of the United States, which is going to become the greatest country on earth, the United States of America. And now I'm done going back to my farm in Virginia. Mic drop, bam. Anyway, that's our show. Thanks for listening. The fans hoping to catch a little bit of the old-time religion right here, baby. With Junior stepping up to the plate. Here comes the stretch. And the pitch to Junior on the way. Swing and a fly ball. It's a deep right center field. That baby is going to be fly away. The old-time religion lives. Junior does it. A two-run home run. And we are tied. Three, three. My, oh my. Magic is back at least for a night. When you don't go to Geico.com, car insurance can seem intense. Like breakup R&B intense. I thought you said you love the sweater that I got you. If you didn't, you could have told me. Geico makes it easy. Just go to Geico.com anytime to update or check your policy without all the extra drama. I even had a gift receipt. All new, Mel B knows who's got talent. He is mine. I'm like laughing so much, my jaw is aching. Now feast your eyes on America's Got Talent, Steve Harvey style. Wowza. Yeah, you got abs. I'll do that. My stomach will be on the floor. <laughs> then Steve's biggest loser battle is back. Pardon me? Did you just drop it? Yeah. Steve Harvey, today at 2 on NBC for New York.